All right. Are we live? Yeah. Are we live? Hope everyone's doing well. If you can hear us and everything's coming across our area, let us know. We have just a tidbit of technical uh, difficulty, so let us know everything has come across here good. We're starting to get some comments in here. Hope everybody had a wonderful Father's Day. It's been beautiful here. Beautiful weather. Hot, but beautiful. Sun's been out all day. So it was a little cool this morning. First thing. Yeah. It was a little overcast. We got out and got in the garden early. Got in the garden and, and then went to church and come back from church and it was hot by then. Took a nap. Took a nap. <laughs> we got ice cream. We got ice cream. They get back in the garden. <laughs> so, yeah. <clears throat> Here we go. All right. Stephen Sykes got a quick question here. Is how do you determine a good cantaloupe? Stephen, I don't like cantaloupes. I grow them like, from time to time. She loves them, but I, I could care less for cantaloupe. Just recently bought one from a large chain grocery store. It was tasteless and hard. Okay. So back in my younger years, we used to handle cantaloupes in the produce business a long time ago. And uh, the way you tell a good cantaloupe, is it gets that good cream, golden cream color all over it. And it normally has that right aroma to it. So it has a smell to it. Some people like, but the main smell. thing for a ripe cantaloupe is for it to be that golden color. A green cantaloupe has a greenish tint to mm -hmm. it. And we call it breakers. That means they're breaking, transitioning into that ripeness. But you want to look for that golden ripe color. Now, when they start getting too ripe, they'll start so you'll start seeing those spots on them there that stem in you'll start rotting a little bit of course it's probably too far gone you know how i like mine how do you like yours with salt and pepper oh. salt and pepper oh, yeah steven so just check your color and it smell it yeah happy, greg black happy father's day greg well thank you so much greg hope you had a wonderful day as well uncle charlie says hi Kiss my grass acre says good evening everyone. Man, I'm gonna tell y'all what, because I know it's hot everywhere. I just looked at the weather before we got on here. So Tuesday, 100 degrees. Wednesday, 102. Thursday is gonna be 102. So what we're facing this next week is probably our hottest week to date. Mm -hmm. And you know, I was telling somebody earlier today. This June has been a lot harder than I remember the last couple of years. So we're, I think we're in for a tough, tough summer. I mean, 102 degrees in June. Mm -mm. Yeah. Hey, Kitchen Godfather. Thanks. That's what we love to do is teach you to grow your own food. Yep. <clears throat> hey, Ben, how do you tell a spaghetti squash is right? Mine's getting close. Yeah, so what you want to do, all right. <clears throat> So I just gathered, I just harvested some this morning. And uh, with these winter squashes, what you want, this is really curious. What you want to do is the skin needs to be tough. The, the, old, the old saying is you got to take your fingernail and try to dig in there. Once your fingernail will not make an impression into that skin right there is when it gets ready to harvest. And what you'll start seeing, you just start seeing the uh, stem getting a little rough looking too. But the main thing is checking that, that skin. And when skin gets past the fingernail test, they're ready to harvest. Now, what I did on my red curry this morning is I got out there early and I clipped them and I piled them up. And I'm going to leave them out there four or five days and let them cure out in the sun. Then we'll harvest them and uh, we'll put them underneath the bar in there. All your winter squashes are pretty much the same way. Uh, the peppos, which is your delicatas, your aguande squash, and those... Uh, you can get by picking those maybe uh, just a little bit. They're going to mature a little bit quicker than these. I guess is the best way to say it. But. <clears throat> Somebody says turn up the volume. Is everybody having trouble hearing or just one person? Can we turn it up? How do you turn it up? Hold on. Let me see if I can turn it up. Hold on. We're going to see if we can. Turn it up. How about that? That should be open. Is that all the way? Yep, this should be. Yeah, there you go. Okay. Is that better? Yeah. You, you made us a little crooked, but. How about that? There you go. Better, better, better. Yes. All right, so we're back. Okay. 
Jason Sturkey, I want to plant a fall crop of watermelons. Do you recommend zone seven? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, you know, used to back in the day, we said nobody ever done that. People do plant fall crops of watermelons now. So, yeah, I, I think it'd be fine to plant a fall crop. Uh, zone seven, you're going to have to do your math on that. Figure out when your last frost date and all that. I'm, you're probably going to need to plant sometime in, in July, I guess, would be. But you have to do the math on that and see. By the way, this coming week's show on Row by Row, we're going to be talking about what you should be doing now in the garden. And we're going to be giving you some some dates and things about different zones when you need to be planting stuff. So we try to do that about once a month. And that's the show we got coming up Tuesday. I mean, excuse me, Thursday. We'll shoot it Tuesday. But we'll air Thursday. Shane's just thanking you <clears throat> for the sugar baby watermelon seeds. The most suckers are delicious. They are. Sugar baby is a good one. Uh, yellow doll is also a good one. It's a yellow one, but as far as red, small watermelon, that baby doll is hard to beat. Bobby, Ricky, will a short sweet corn require less fertilizer and take less out of the soil than a tall sweet corn? No, that's a good question. I don't know. You know, common sense will tell you, yeah, you're right. It would because you, you grow more foliage there. But you know, different years. <sighs> Stalk size is, is different for different years for me. This year on my sweet corn, we have a small stalk. We made wonderful corn, but our corn got probably two foot, if not more, shorter than it normally is. Mm -hmm. My Jimmy Red out there, my field corn, and I planted three weeks behind the sweet corn, is the tallest Jimmy Red I've ever had. It's 11, 12 feet. Never grown Jimmy Red with that much stalk. It's just weird that uh, different, different times you grow different size stalks. Doesn't seem to have that much effect on the actual cob, the corn cob, but it is weird. I've noticed that myself. Yeah, Lisa Jacobs, from what are you seeing now? Will there be a seed shortage next year? No, we don't think so. Uh, we're going to Iowa for a meeting the 1st of August. Cameron, our seed manager, and I are going to be spending three days up there with uh, <clears throat> all the seed suppliers. And uh, we're going to be getting some insights there. We do an annual meeting and we all get together. So we'll know more when we get back there. But from what we're seeing, not necessarily a seed shortage. They are particular varieties. I'm going to give you an example here. There's a, there's a sweet corn that we've been wanting to add to our lineup. And it's, out, it's not going to be available until 2023. And we've been trying to get it for the last year. They are just very unique stuff. It may have sold out that you can't only get, but for the most part, no, there's not a seed shortage. Just in they're just weird individual varieties that make it a little short. <clears throat> mm. Oh, KP, thank you very much. Happy Father's Day, Greg and Michelle. God bless you both. Is the Lanino Plus massive hot ocean heat in the gut <laughs> severe weather ingredients? Man, you know. We ain't talked about hurricanes much, but I'm really concerned mm, with this with this hot weather that we have this time. We're gonna have a very violent storm season there. So yeah, I'm concerned about that as well. Man, I just don't remember being 102 in June. I don't mm -hmm. the last few years. And our soil moisture here is getting kind of low. So it's gonna be a tough one. I'm gonna tell you one thing that's weird though. We direct planted direct seeded zines Thursday. Thursday. Them suckers was up Saturday morning. Now we irrigated them in, but they were really? up in two days. Wow. wow. This heat and moisture will make something make something go. But uh yeah. What's the best time to run your drip irrigation next week when we are in the triple digits? Anytime, it really doesn't matter. Now I, I don't like to turn it on in the middle of the day if it's if it's hot and not like a scotch and hot water to go through the tape. But uh yeah, your drip irrigation is not, but besides that initial heat that goes through the tape, that really hot, hot water, I always have a fear of it scorching my roots. I don't know if there's anything to that or not. Uh, run it at night, run it during the daytime, whatever. With that drip irrigation, you're not, you're not looking at, especially if you got beard, you're not looking at very, very little evaporation. So on my corn, when it's tasseling like this now, I ran it all night the other night. So I will on particular crops that, that need a lot of moisture right now, run it all night. 
Backyard Garden says hello. Hello from Kentucky. Come on, Kentucky. Hounds of Goshen. Good evening. Yep. <coughs> uh, oh, just a minute. Sharon, it's been hot in zone 10 in Florida. Oh, I bet. The National Weather Service won't let me access <laughs> <laughs> It's so bad. They won't even, they won't even uh, tell you how hot it is. That's cool. How about it, Shane? I'm in Louisiana. We're getting heat like I've never seen before. And want to do a fall tomato crop this year. You think I can handle the pressure, press, pest pressure? Do you think it's worth a shot? Yeah, I do. I mean, I, it does seem to be we're going to have a hot one, but I, you know, I'm going to plant a fall crop as well. A lot of people planting fall uh, tomato crop. One thing that you will notice, and I didn't mention this the other day on the show, but you'll notice less virus pressure in the fall of the year than you do in the springtime. Now, normally you will see more white fly problems in the fall, a lot more white fly problems that you do in springtime, but you'll see less virus. So, yeah, just stay on top of them, try to keep those white flies under control. And if we have that hot, dry year, they're going to be bad. So, <clears throat> happy Father's Day, Greg. Love watching y'all on Sunday. Well, thank you so much. We enjoy being with you guys. Susie says, I've heard that coffee grounds are good for the garden. Are tea grounds good also? I don't see why not. I tell you the reason the grounds are good. Of course, it's organic matter, but the worms will look. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. She put coffee grounds in. We don't drink a lot of tea, but she puts coffee grounds in her worm bed. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it does feed the worms and the, they love it. So. Linda, Linda Sanchez, good to see you. Yeah. Hey, Linda. I guess y'all are in the middle of fig season down there, Linda. We uh we've gathered a few of our we have that first crop, if they call it the breeder crop that comes in. We had a few of those, but our fig trees are loaded. And every time I go out there and mess with my figs, Linda, I think about y'all. I really do. Because y'all are my fig mentors. Hey Kathy. <clears throat> I have been canning tomatoes. I made um stewed tomatoes. Then I taught two of my friends how to do my salsa recipe that's going to be airing Tuesday night. Mm -hmm. And then next, well, a week from Tuesday, I did spaghetti sauce with meat. I've never canned meat before, but I did it. And we actually had it for lunch mm -hmm. today. It and it was good. The texture was good. Yep. I, I may do some more of that. Always worries me when we start canning meat, but that was good. It was good. Yeah. Hello from Unionville, Missouri. Cool. Drip tape is saving. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Welch Farms, North Carolina. Drip tape is saving my crops. Thanks for your fast shipping. You know, I say this every year. Was it last year we had a wet year? It was last mm -hmm. year. <clears throat> last year we had that wet year and I didn't hardly ever use my drip tape. You know, and you, you think to yourself, man, I wasted some money and wasted a lot of time putting it down. But it is a great insurance policy. And this year it's really paying off. I would not have made a garden if I didn't have drip tape. I don't believe I could have kept my overhead overhead sprinkler going. I know I couldn't have my corn. Mm -hmm. I, I couldn't have kept or my watermelons either. About it, David. I live in central Arkansas. It's very hot and dry. Yep. And I have most of my tomatoes and water daily. What else can I do to get through this hot spell? That's that's pretty much keep them fed, keep them fed, keep them treated, you know, with insecticide, fungicide. We you will see on these hot humidity days it, it stresses those plants. So you don't want anything to come in there as far as insect disease. So keep them sprayed with a fungicide. And set aside late in the afternoon or early morning and keep that water on and keep them keep them as happy as you can rick the junkyard garden need opinion if i were to successfully plant into my summer squash plot with a blue hubbard and religiously heat it with bt could i possibly see improvements next season and next season in next season in next plot I rate two. Uh, yes, possibly, possibly you could. Uh, I think I don't think it's going to do New Year's much good for next year as it is this year. Was that that hover is just going to be a trap? It's just going to be a trap crop for now. So you know, I don't think that's going to necessarily knock your population down. 
Now, one thing that we have really noticed is, is just as soon as those squash plants get through, go in there and take them out and get you a cover crop planted in there, such as buckwheat or soil stain grass. What we have noticed is that helps to break up soil cycle, those insects living in the soil cycle, and that helps tremendously. It's keeping things coming along there, such as that. And that will help you with your vine borers and squash buds and things like that. That's probably the best advice there is good housekeeping. Keep it cleaned out and keep something growing in those soils. It's going to break that cycle. Ocean soil, does <clears throat> strip tape work in four by eight raised beds? It does. Not, not necessarily the best because uh, you have to put a lot of fittings and stuff there. We are working on a drip irrigation kit for raised beds mm. for next year. Yep. Cool. Yep. Frank, I find my garden plants love being healed. It helps with the heat too. Yep, it does. Uh, especially things like tomatoes, sweet potatoes. I got sweet potatoes growing. They love being healed. Yeah. A lot of plants love healing. Some of the ones that really don't take too kind to it, maybe it's peppers, but a lot of other things just love it. it gives it support. Mm. Oh, no. I think you're going backwards. Uh, All right. Hello from Unionville, Missouri. Hope you're staying cool. We are doing our best, Bob. Melissa, do you grow a specific crop, the hoss native for tomatoes, or do you grow several varieties? I want to put up for winter, but love all the varieties. Yeah, we grow a lot of them. I don't know how many tomato varieties I got growing. I probably have 15 different varieties growing. I, we grow hallucinators. We got them trialing against some more varieties. We got varieties that we don't care that the seed breeders send us to trial down here. Some of them do well and some of them don't. And we had some new varieties this year that we grew that we've never grown before. So yeah, we grew a lot of them. Hallucinator is does really good for us. I mean, really yeah. good. It's got I, and good. I've just been putting them all up. Yeah, they, I mean, this. if I was going to grow let me, I wouldn't do this right here. <clears throat> if you're a pretty good sized garden and you're going to grow a lot of tomato plants, I wouldn't grow just one variety. I would grow uh, two different varieties just in case there. Example would be uh, if I wanted two determinants in the springtime, I planted red snapper and hoss native beside one another. For my fall crop, I'm going to plant Florida 91 and hoss native. So I always like to plant two varieties just so I can compare the two there. Next year, I can go ahead and tell you, last year I grew Purple Boy and Lemon Boy, and I have missed those this year. Yeah, I missed the Purple Boy. I'm going to grow some more Purple Boy and Lemon and, Boy. Uh, yeah. Not a lot of them, but I'm going to grow a few more. There's a, indeterminate types, and we don't need a lot of them, but I am going to grow. Our staple as far as putting up tomatoes and tomato sandwiches is going to be that red snapper hallucinator. But I do I do miss and Bella Rose. The, and Bella Rose, yeah, we can't forget Bella Rose. But I do love those Purple Boys and Lemon Boys. Uh -uh. Okay. Hi, Greg and Sheila. Can you go over the best way to treat for adult squash bugs? You're going to have to either pick them off or either you're going to have to go with something pretty harsh like Bug Buster 2. Bug Buster 2 is a pyrethroid and it'll get them, but you're going to have a probably back off on uh, your harvesting because you're going to have to look at what your reharvest instrument is. I don't know what it is on squash off the top of my head. I do know on tomatoes this one day. But you'll hit the red label. It's a pyrethroid. It's not organic. And then it will get them. It'll knock them back. But uh, you, at this point on squash bugs, you can forget any type of organic sprays. You're going to have to hit them hard or either get there and pick them off. <clears throat> if I were to succession plant and to We've my. Already that. No, I haven't. With a blue hovered and religiously hit with BT, could I possibly see improvements? Yeah, we answered that. Yeah. Yeah, how the Goshen, have you ever thought about doing a day-long seminar on drip irrigation? I'd love to participate if you do. We should do more videos on that. Maybe a live mm -hmm. or something. That's a good, yeah. good point. You know, drip irrigation is, to me, it's really simple, but I can see how uh, how people need more, need more of that. You know, I was watching um, Walker Family Farm, 
and they were actually doing some drip irrigation and they were reusing their drip irrigation. They was moving uh -huh. it from one plot to another plot and it yeah. was a really good video. Yeah. Yeah. Little things like that, little tricks we could probably share with some people. It's great. Appreciate that feedback there. Kathy, can I, I can't get my mind, mind off your fried green tomatoes. Can you post the recipe, please? If you will email custserve at hostools.com, I will send you the recipe. Um, and we hope to soon on our website have a recipe under the Hoss University. I'm going to fry some tonight. You are? Mm -hmm. You gonna do it like me? I do. Those were delicious on the <clears throat> You don't know how to do them. I, I'm gonna let you go out there. Oh, so have. you want me to fry yeah. something like So just to give y'all a heads up, we've, we started preparing about an hour <laughs> and a half ago because we've been talking about it all day, what we're gonna eat for dinner tonight. We have fresh green beans, <clears throat> fresh corn, fresh okra, potatoes. Yeah, onions. Onions. Yeah. And you're going to fry some green tomatoes. We're going to be sick. We're going to be sick. And, and we got some uh, good sausage we're going to cook with yeah. all that. So, anyhow, we're looking forward to that. I've been, we've been, I got up there and got the okra all to cut up, letting it sweat. We got everything just sitting on standby. Yeah. We're going to board you out tonight. Deborah Stucker, my tomato leaves are curling up in a flower pot. Do you have any suggestions? Yeah, some of these varieties will curl. Normally they curl when they get stressed. Make sure you keep them watered well in a flower pot. Then things are going to dry out and they're going to stress out with this heat a lot more than they usually would. Keep the water pour to them. Uh, keep them sprayed. So when they get stressed out, whether it be disease, insect, or anything, a lot of times heat, they'll start curling there. So maybe hit them with an insecticide, fungicide. But the main thing is to make sure they stay in plenty of moisture in those pots. If I need a pumpkin variety for hot regions, Central California, over 100 most of the days in August last year, tried four years in a row, I got nothing at all. That's Bay Arias. Aquinas. Yeah, I'm going to tell you one that I've been extremely successful with. Now, it's not an orange pumpkin, but it is a, uh, a blue pumpkin. In, uh, what's it? Bayou? Blue Bayou? Blue Bayou. That Blue Bayou is probably the most disease resistant pumpkin we carry. Uh, it's it's really, if you've ever grown Jared, Jaredale, it's real similar to Jaredale, but Blue Bayou, you can't tell the difference from looking at the pumpkin. Blue Bayou is a lot more disease resistant than Jaredale is. And Blue Bayou, I grew it a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. It did extremely well for us. And we have disease pressure like you guys do. So I know, you, I feel your pain, but try that Blue Bayou. <clears throat> Kiss my grass. Just as the hype of the garden season began, I got the C. Now my boys have to do my work. Feel your pain. <laughs> we yeah. had the pleasure of having that um, week for last. Yeah. Hi, Trish. Thank you much. I will keep them coming during this summer. Mark Prescott, good to hear from you, Mark. Hope you're doing well. I hope you're managing the heat up there. I run my entire 1.5 acres with drip irrigation. I have nine field plots and run two of them, one for 45 minutes. I let the first two depressurize one of the first is running. Interesting. And then attach to the next field box. Hmm. Sounds like you got a pretty good system, Mark. I hope you're having a good harvest up there. We're having a pretty good year down here so far. Ethan, what's up, dude? Hi, guys from New York. Just received my signal wheel hoe and loving it so far. Was preparing a new garden plot using a tiller. It is fine to just till two or three inches deep, then use the wheel hoe to cultivate. That's yep. what we do. That's what we do. We prepare with the tiller. After I plant, we don't use the tiller. I don't use the tiller anymore after I plant. <clears throat> How about it? LB4 LSU. Happy Father's Day, Greg. Well, thank you. Happy Father's Day to you as well. I don't have a flail, but but took my corn down with a finish mower on the tractor. I should be able to wet it a bit and cover with the side of the start and break it down. Absolutely. Yep. Side of the start's going to work good for that. It, it doesn't really matter what you got. You just got to get those stalks cut down when they're green. And uh, 
You know, I, I got my corn plot there that I've already cut down and mowed. I'm letting it sit just a little bit. I'm trying to figure out what I'm going to plant there. I may end up planting, because I'm going to plant this a fall crop of summer things, zippers. Mm -hmm. And I may end up planting behind that corn. Mm -hmm. I've been thinking about that. Zippers, yeah. I think I'm going to plant some zippers. Talk about those hoss green blades. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Did you pick, it was last night you picked mm -hmm. the hoss. She For the second a, time, the second a five-gallon bucket. A five-gallon bucket off the hall screen blades in this 100-degree heat, which is not bothering them at all. No, they look good. They on drip irrigation, and they look really, I, I am amazed at these green blades. They're good beans, too. We're starting to get stung up a little bit, so I'm going to have to kick up my pest, uh, pesticide spray on them. But, but the heat's not bothering But the heat's not bothering them. Yeah. David, Hoss, have you ever planted jet star tomatoes? I have not. I have a good luck with them in Arkansas. Take the heat well. Interesting. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Jet star tomato. I may have to check those out. Anita Baldwin High from Stamp and Anita in Huntsville, Alabama, northern Alabama. Hi, folks. Any, any info on what we can do to ensure our success on raising corn in 4x4 four four raised beds zone 7B? Neither. <laughs> uh, you, I'm not a proponent of planting corn in raised beds. I know people out there do it. We have this conversation in the office here sometimes because they some raised bed gardeners in their office and they want to plant corn. Corn just does better in the flat and it does better in bigger plots. I would not plant a smaller plot than a 20 by 20 corn. That would be the smallest plot I would plant in corn. It's pollinated by the wind. You're not going to get good pollination in a four by eight red bed. It's just not going to work out well for you. I think there are so many more things you can be productive with in a small bed like that, except for corn. Uh, you've got some melons growing in yours. Mm -hmm. I normally wouldn't recommend that, mm -hmm. but you're doing it kind of because you raised those seedless watermelons. But uh, melons, uh, I don't recommend for raised beds, and then corn. I just think I think there's a better way to go there. <clears throat> Chase, what's up, dude? Also, what would be the best one, in your opinion, to grow in central LA next year due to our very hot summers and super high humidity? Uh, I'm a fan of the three ones I'm going to mention to you. I'm a big fan of sangria. Sangria. Yellow doll is the yellow. So I got both of these growing right now. And then we, we had a, somebody earlier talking about sugar baby. Sugar baby is a great one too. So if you want to grow a small red meated mm -hmm. sugar baby, if you want to branch out and do a yellow meated yellow dog, but if you want that big red watermelon sangria, hands down, it's the one to go with. Frank, to protect my zucchinis from the boar, one the, the, the dreaded vine boar. Mm -hmm. I wrap the base of my plants with aluminum foil. So far, it has worked for me. It seems the worms hate to reflect. Great tip, Frank. That is interesting. Never done that. Of course, you know what? We don't have very little problem down here with buying more. And I know a lot of people do. We just don't. Ocean Soul. <laughs> Mama Hoss, what is your delicious recipe? When is your really delicious recipe book coming out? You're a great cook. Thank you very much. I don't have plans for one, but we do have plans for putting them on the website. Trish, I put my drip irrigation in. It's pretty easy. I struggle with what I can put yeah. in it. Yeah. So, Trish, I'm going to give you a couple of hints here. There's different products out there that are water soluble, but it's not real clear a lot of times for what is water soluble or not. But I'm going to give you a little tidbit right here. Everything that we carry as far as calcium nitrate, ammonia, excuse me, calcium nitrate, uh, ammonia sulfate. Uh, our 202020 and our uh, organic, organic, which is our Chilean nitrate. All of our stuff, we make sure <coughs> it's water soluble. But the key word in industry, what's called, is greenhouse grade. So if you buy a product, make sure that you buy a greenhouse grade product, and that's code for it being water soluble. A lot of things, just like calcium nitrate, they is greenhouse grade and there's non greenhouse grade. The greenhouse grade is the only one you can put through the injector. And look, 99% of the time, that's not on any label or anything. So you got to make sure you get the greenhouse green. Bay, what is that? Acres? 
Curious Aquarius. I asked last slide too about a pumpkin for hot regions. Can you answer me before my planning window closes? I think we answered that. Didn't you say Blue Bayou? Yeah, Blue Bayou would be a good one. Yeah. If, and it, but it's not orange pumpkin. But we got a couple of orange pumpkins out there. I thought we got one called Mustang. Do we have Mustang? But we got we got some some good hybrid varieties right here. Uh, make sure you get one that is powdery mildew resistant. I know the Blue Bayou is good. How about that? I think I got it now. Is that better? Yep, that's it. That's it. We're back. We're back. Yeah, it, we're a little crooked, but we're back. We're still shooting stuff. 
Uh-oh. Sorry about that. Yeah. This 100 degree weather's got everything going wompy wompy. Okay, so I don't know if they heard the agrothrive, but yes. Yeah, we, we don't, I'm not real familiar with agrothrive, but our 2020-20 and our calcium nitrate and our microboost, those three products is everything you should need for anything in that shape, family. So, what causes cucumbers to turn yellow on the vine? Uh, when they're past maturity. So when they get to growing real quick in this hot weather, you got to keep them picked. And if you don't pick them, they will turn yellow on the vine. So... Got to keep that many produced in this heat, so you got to keep up with it. Uh, we don't have any cucumbers coming in right now, but if they did, we'd be picking now, up. No, you know, I've still got some on my vines, my two vines. Yep. I've got, I picked like six this morning. Well, right. but I think they're about done. Yeah, so keep them picked. I don't see a video, I did, didn't I see a video by about when you're trying to view pole type butterbean? Yes, I've got a newer planet out there and it's growing well. It will probably be the end of the year before we know the total results of so, it, but we, uh, yeah, we are trialing one. It's excited about it. It's a small, regular sized butterbean that is a speck of butterbean, mm -hmm. which is good. Ah, Mark says we harvested more than 400 pounds of gold prize. Wow. Behind the zucchini and green griller. We're nice. having green griller tonight. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And a moonbeam and delivered to a senior box program coordinated by the county. Cool, Mark. That's awesome. Yeah, I love growing squash. What fig types are you growing, Greg? Oh, man. Uh, I got some LSU purples. I got uh, LSU yellow. I've got. Uh, Man, I've, I've got, brown. I got, of course, I got one brown turkey, but I've got uh, a 256 I. I can't remember what the I stands for, but if you look up figs, you got 256 I. Uh, I will tell you this I, the LSU varieties I really like. LSU has released several varieties over the years, and I, those are probably some of my favorites. Now, you need to look at fig trees and see what flavor profile you like. I, I lean more toward the berry profile figs, so that's the ones I like. But the, the 256 I is a good one, and all my LSU ones I would highly recommend. <laughs> hey, that spicy tomato on the BIT was too funny. She got me there. Yeah. Yeah, I knew something was up, but I didn't know why. <clears throat> so I have to admit the I tried on the last row by row, he did a taste test to see if we was trying to see if he really knew his Duke's minnows. So one of the ones I did was a spicy mayo, but I might have added a little bit of hot sauce. <laughs> it was kicking, don't boy. No, oh, it was funny. <clears throat> if if y'all didn't get that, go back and see it. <clears throat> hey, Brent, backyard gardener here. Any ideas on fighting off the middle grass, sending underground rhizomes into the plot this time of year? They put, they push off the mulch and weed fabric. Yeah. Well, I'm going to give you a little bit of tidbit on and Bermuda grass is horrible. Just stay after it. But for some reason or another, if you turn this in the fall of the year and you turn it under, it seems not to come back near as bad. So there's not a whole lot you can do at this point but just stay after it. But I will tell you toward the end of August and uh, September and October, if you've got, if you've got somewhere to turn it, we used to use a turning plow, but if you turn it in the fall of the year, I don't really know why, but the old timers have always told me this, and it does make seem to be true. It makes a huge difference in keeping your uh, keeping your Bermuda grass from coming back. I still got this little crooked up there. Yeah, you do. Yeah, Chase, hello from Pineville, Louisiana. Love your products, videos, and all you do, Mr. Greg and Mama Halls. Keep up the great work. Also, Miss Greg, hope you've had a good Father's Day. Well, thank you, Chase. We've had a wonderful Father's Day. And it's going to be even better after a while when I get all the good groceries out of the garden. Mm -hmm. Yep. What bush bean do you recommend? This is from Jason Sturkey. I tried to plant Blue Lake twice in different locations, and greenhouse millipedes were eating them before they sprouted. The other two varieties don't bother. Hoss Green Blade. I tell you, after this year, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be, y'all gonna get tired of hearing me say Hoss Green Blade. I don't know why anybody wants to plant any other variety. I really don't. Now, do I, they taste good. They taste good. They do. One thing, I, one thing I don't know is how they're gonna transition in a late fall crop when it gets cool. 
that I'm going to have to test to see how it do, does into that, what we call slot. That last slot going in the wintertime, I'm going to test it on that and see how it does in cool weather. But so far, I don't know why anybody won't plant anything you do. Mark, always good. The horse tools from the seeds, great germination and everything, but my mini fails. Really? Mm -hmm. Well. I harvested some mini baby bells today. Yep. David says, I appreciate your answer to these questions. I've had my guard most of my life, but always trying to learn what I can. God bless and stay hydrated. David, you know what I do too. I've been gardening all my life and I learn something all the time. So mm -hmm. I never, never were gardening or you don't know anything. So we're always learning. How about Jubilee Watermelon? I hear that anyone talking about them, they are called the Florida Giant. KP, man, back in the day, mm -hmm. that Jubilee Watermelon was all we talked about. Uh, yeah, Jubilee was the, the go-to watermelon in the 80s. 60s, I'd say the 60s and 70s and 80s, that was the king. It had crimson sweet, and it was probably a little more popular than the crimson sweet was. Yeah, Jubilee's a great watermelon. Sangria came along, I'll tell you what happened. Sangria came along after that, and Sangria's got a lot better disease package than the Jubilee does. So that's kind of where the Jubilee fell by the wayside. Yeah, Grump, South Georgia. In Florida, man, there was a many, many of you believe growing back in the day. Walker family, family, you guys, hey. hey, uh, she just talked about y'all. I was talking about y'all in your drip irrigation video that yes. was really good. Yep. Cool. Pamela's plantation. Have y'all ever grown in a green stalk? I have limited land available and getting great starts and they fizzle out. Need good container fertilizer. Organic. Yeah, the complete organic, organic would work good for you there. No, I've not used a green stalk. We have a lot of friends that rave and rave about them, but we don't have one, or I have never personally laid eyes on one. Mm -mm. But Jason and all of them, what we call Jason, he would just West, rave about it. Yeah, yeah rave about it. And if you got, I can see if you got a small space how they'd work wonderful. Jay Tharp, happy Father's Day, Mr. Greg. Thank you so much. And beautiful Miss Hoss. <laughs> My contender bus beans from y'all are amazing. Pickle harvest today. Love all Hoss Tools products. Thank you. And I guess y'all uh Miss I guess y'all down in Texas, I'm sure y'all yeah. as hot as we are. Yeah. They they uh comment on Facebook all the time. I appreciate all your comments. Yeah. <laughs> Jonathan, hey, Mr. And Miss Greg, I stopped by Friday and picked up my <laughs> Yeah, I met Maggie. She might be a little bit spoiled. Any idea with a drip layer attachment and a plow set will be available? Great question. Uh, Jonathan, I'm hoping on the, <laughs> I'm hoping on the plow set this coming week, but uh, our manufacturer wouldn't make those for us be giving us to run around a little bit there. Uh, we're going to have a good talk with them probably in the morning. So I hope to have some of those this week. I can't guarantee you anything. The drip layer attachment is probably going to be out a little bit more on those. We told them, they, they made this company in Tifton, John, you'll know where Tifton's at, makes both those things for us. And I told them to do the plows before they did the drip layer attachment. So we got, we're waiting on both of those. Mm -hmm. we need for 10 weeks, it's been, we'll yeah. have them next week. We'll have them next week. Yeah. So. Drip layer tax was going to be a while, but we hope the plows are soon, soon, soon. Thank you, Jonathan. Albert, what is causing tomato leaves to curl on my, I mean, leaves to curl on my tomato plants? So, uh, normally it's stress, but we did see this year, I've even had it in mind more so than I've ever had it before, called it yellow leaf curl which is a disease. Uh, we're seeing some of that there. You'll see some yellow one along with the curl there. Normally curling is a is just stress of the plant. And uh, some varieties, believe it or not, are more resistant to leaf curl than others. Make sure that you got plenty of moisture. Make sure that your insect pressure is down. And that's basically all you can do. And this heat within itself is going to cause some varieties just to curl up. A lot of times it doesn't have, it's not detrimental to the plant, but it's not really good, but it's not detrimental to the plant. My new Tennessee home, glad to make it. I'm sitting here, milk guys, <laughs> watching your live. Cool. 
We milked with many goats, so we know we build your pain. We had goats when uh, when our kids was kids was little for years. We had milk that's goats. all we had. Yeah. 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 And goats. I miss them. I do miss them. I don't miss having to do it every 12 hours, but I do miss the goats. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> when is, okay, <clears throat> hopefully I get a good harvest this year. And if I do, I will do a video series on how to make the Roselle wine. Yeah. Jenny wanted to know, when is Mama Hoss making a Roselle wine? Will, what's up, dude? Will from Dixie Meadow Farms. Happy Father's Day. Well, thank you, Will. And happy Father's Day to you as well. What's your favorite flower to plant down in the southern heat? Sunflower. Yeah, but I got, my rotation was, I got sunflowers coming off zinnias. Zinnias. They popped, well, I planted some, I believe it was Wednesday, and they popped up. It was Wednesday and Thursday. They popped up in two days. Mm-hmm. So uh, we got zinnias coming along. I got I got to fertilize them in the morning. I'm going to irrigate them again in the morning. Uh, zinnias love the heat. Mm-hmm. These binary giant that we have are powder immunity resistant. And what you're going to see now with zinnias is going in this hot humidity, you're going to see a lot of disease problems. So make sure you plant those binary giants. They, they'll they stand up to the heat and the powder mildew a little bit better than some of the other ones. About it, B, are y'all seeing many pollinators? We are not. We don't have a problem here, but there is a lot of bees across the road because there's a huge patch of watermelons over there and they brought a bunch of bees in. I had a hive, I lost my hive here. So I did have problems with my own hive, but we got a lot of, we have plenty of bees, but I talked to a buddy of mine the other day that's a beekeeper, and he said he's having problems this year, a lot of problems what? with bees, yep. Wayne up, Wayne up. He said he didn't know. Hmm. He said he didn't know, but he's having a lot of problems. He's the only beekeeper that I talk to on a regular basis, but that's what he said. Laura says, I really love growing the jambalaya okra. It's doing great. Question though, when do you think the best time for planting my gypsy peppers? I'm in 9B. Love y'all's channel. I would say plant them. I th- you're talking about planting from seeds for the fall crop. I would wait in zone 9 till the middle of July. Middle to the end of July would be when I would plant my peppers, Laura. And I think you could probably have peppers going in December. Mm-hmm. Easy. Easy. <clears throat> Anita, how can I send a picture of the celebrity tomato plant it has, has fruit and look great and now the top is with send it customer serve uh customer C- service hostels C U S T S E R V E at hostels.com. It's on the website on the bottom of it. Yeah. yeah. If you go to our website, scroll to the bottom, you can see the email address. Or somewhere on our Facebook, you can message us a picture, I think, as well. Yeah. On Instagram. Yeah. How late is it to plant a chili pepper like the hatch? How late is too late to plant a chili pepper like the hatch? It's corn where you live at. Uh, last year, now I know this is kind of a fluke thing. Last year, we had peppers here to December. To December. So you could plant, uh, if you live in zone 7, 8, 9, I don't think you'll have a problem planting them. I would plant probably in uh, July and August, but I don't think. You can keep those things growing in the fall. Just keep them treated. Man, they'll continue to make and make and make. Root shoots and garden boots. I love that. I love that name too. Happy Father's Day. Well, thank you so much. I thoroughly enjoyed our horse products. I purchased great success so far. Well, that's what it's all about. It's us helping you be successful. That's the core of what we do right there. And that makes us feel good when you're successful because that's that is everything that we do here at Hoss Tools. Every question we ask, everything we do is centered around helping you to be every successful. Product every product, every, everything we do. When we start having conversations about doing anything, the question comes up, was well, this going to help people? And if it does, then it leads to uh, doing more things like that. So that, that makes us feel good. Thank you. Oh, green peppers for stuffing. <clears throat> Bad luck with California Wonder as the Blossom BSW is hot here in Florida. Oh, man. That's good. Can you, you like Poblanos? No, she's talking about first. Oh, yeah. Poblanos. I love the Poblanos. Yeah. Uh, also, those um, 
I picked a bunch today. That series, Aren't You Sweet, Right on Red, mm -hmm. and Yes to Yellow, yeah. are awesome. And even the pimentos are yeah. really good. See, there's something about a bell pepper. I don't. I'm not a big. I don't like bell pepper. She does, but I've never liked. But there's a flavor there thing to it that I don't like. So we don't grow a lot of bell peppers. We grow a few just for she to use. And those cubanelle. Cubanelles, the bananas, yeah. those banana peppers are great for stuffing for us and the pimentos and the ride right on red and that series there. That's the ones I go with. Mm -hmm. Spa Diva, been looking good to plant some hatch peppers, but not so sure they will grow in, in six. Uh, yeah, I, I don't think you have a problem. What is hatch peppers? Look at that one. Look at that one there. All right. Ocean Souls, we need to hit, we all need to hit the like button. Yes, you do. If you enjoy it, hit the like button, do a little share, help us out there. Give us some love. My new Tennessee home says, Miss Hoss, I got some of your Roselle seeds this year, and I think they're going to make, they're three foot tall and looking good. They love the heat. Yeah, mine is about three foot. I've actually got two plots. I got one in the garden. Mm-hmm. And then I've got one down by fence road mm -hmm. that I'm not doing anything to. Right. Because I think last year I watered them too much. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I hope between the both of them, because I I have just, I think I have two bottles of wine left and I have about a cup of the dried. Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to be out. Yeah. So it should be a good Roselle year. How many times will contender bush beans give a crop? We just picked third time. Be in this heat here, I think you're doing good to get a third picking out of there. Anything beyond the third picking is going to be a bonus there. Uh, we can pick them five times in the early spring. This heat here is going to it's going to tear them up. I'm I'm surprised that you got three three pickings off of them right now. So it's a chili pepper. Yep. <clears throat> Ethan Samel, in my garden while preparing a plot, I found lots of large rocks, cement clumps about five to nine inches under the surface. Is it possible to dig them up? Can I still plant soil over them? Yeah, I've seen people. We was uh, we was in the Bahamas, in some of the outer islands of the Bahamas years ago. Cat Island. And uh, I was walking around there. It's very uninhabited area. But they do a little farming there. And the guy farmed, I seen him farming his spot. No, only two we had was a machete. And they planted underneath rocks mm -hmm. because if they didn't have irrigation and those rocks shielded some of the sunlight out, therefore saving the moisture. So they would plant, he had a tomato patch. It was a pretty good sized tomato patch here. And he planted them, all those tomatoes underneath those rocks and they would come out above that. And mm -hmm. that always yeah. stuck with me. So yeah, work with your rocks. This is the thing about rocks. Most people don't know. Rocks are full of minerals. So if you got rocky soil, most of the time you have very high mineralized soil. Ah, Brad, I bought some seeds from Home Depot and from you. I never buy from Home Depot again. I'll go off on this little tangent here, Brad, and I'll tell you the reason why. <clears throat> if you'll notice, our seeds cost more than what you buy at Home Depot and Lowe's. Here's the thing. When we, we have there's several different suppliers from seeds out there. When we have the hot, the opportunity to buy a higher grade seed that's been, example, that's being virus tested, we always buy those type of seeds that have been virus tested and they always cost more. But we always take advantage of anything that we can get to get higher quality seeds versus the cheapest of the seed. All your seed rack people are going to be buying the cheapest seed possible. And then our seeds are stored in a temperature humidity mm -hmm. controlled room yep. all the way up till the time they're packed yep. and shipped. Also, uh, and we germ test. And we germ test and our seeds, a lot of our seeds are disease resistant varieties that you can't get off a of seed rack because of the cost. Of it. So yeah, there's a reason that our seeds cost more. It's because we do some things there to, uh, ensure to you be more successful. I, I was talking to a rep about that, and I mentioned this right here. If anybody goes to Home Depot and buys a pack of seeds and they don't come up, well, they don't go back to Home Depot and ask for a replacement on the seeds. But if anybody buys some seeds from us and they don't come and up, they, don't germinate they want to know why. And, and, they, and they should. 
because mm-hmm. they're paying for higher quality seeds. And that's that's fine. But uh, we're held to a higher standards than what those seed pack guys are. And that's fine because that's what we do. Rick, the junkyard gardener, first year growing sweet potatoes, kept them watered into the new growth. Now they're taken off. Mine is as well. What kind of schedule show can they be? Excuse me. Look here. What kind of schedule show they be on with all this drought and heat? Keep, I guess you're talking about fertilizer. Keep them fertilized and keep them more. Now, sweet potatoes will tolerate some dry, because they love the heat. But I just side dressed mine uh, yesterday morning. I like side dressed potatoes. We also inject some fertilizer in there, but I side dress them as well. So uh, once they get that canopy over, they're going to be hard to do anything with. So you need to get you a good base fertilizer to put down there. Got them on drip tape. Just keep them watered. Don't overwater them, but keep them watered. I'm watering mine as we speak right now, mm-hmm. matter of fact. Curtis, I moved to the Texas to Illinois 12 years wow. ago. I grew up in Texas, but my in-laws can grow any suggestions. Yep, I will. Try jambalaya. Now, the reason I'm going to recommend jambalaya to you, jambalaya's got a little shorter growing season than any rest of them that I'm aware of. It will mature two to three weeks before any rest of them. So try growing jambalaya, a shorter season okra like that, I think you'll be more successful. Ah, there you go. <clears throat> Hatch Chili's grown in Hatch, New Mexico, a small town. I know a chili farmer there would love the show. Well, cool, Todd, thanks for, thanks for that. Thanks for all different kind of papers there, you know mm-hmm. what? Well, we're about to wrap it up, how about that? Mm-hmm. We're going to go cook us a One good, more question. Last good question. garden supper. And my, the big thing I'm looking for, is fried okra, and I may, may stir fry it, and some of those hallucinators sliced up with it. Last question. KP, I do have a question. I had to step out for a minute. Greg, my heirloom tomatoes are not looking bad, but the blossoms are dropping from the heat. Should I pull them when they produce in the fall? Leave them. Unless, as long as the vine's looking good, leave them and let them see what they're doing. So if the vine starts going bad, probably give up on them. Uh, one you may want to grow next year, and we're going to have the seed next year. We don't have now that we grew this year is Pink Delicious. Pink Delicious has been a stand-up heirloom-type variety for us. Thank you, KP. Well, thank y'all. Thank y'all for joining us. It's been a blast. We're going to go down there and cook us a big supper and enjoy the rest of the evening, and I hope you do all as well. Thank y'all.